Good morning. Welcome everyone. Welcome back to our third and final day of our statewide school health conference. I'm Tracy Mendez. I'm the executive director of CSHA, and I'm so pleased to be with you here today. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for making our event such a great one so far. My heart is so warm to see so many of you here and to hear you engaging your smart and thoughtful questions, your contributions to the dialogue, um, enhancing what our presenters bring. Someone in their evaluation on Tuesday said that the event, the conference had reconnected them to their sense of purpose. And that's the way I feel as well. So energized, thank you. Um, this morning to get us regrounded, I have the great pleasure of introducing you to Lance McGee. If you haven't already had the um, fortune of being in a wellness break with Lance, you are in for a treat. When I first met Lance at Frick Middle School in East Oakland, I wanted to cry. He has created a wellness room for uh, staff at the school that is a, san a total sanctuary. It um, smells like lavender. He brings this calm, trauma-informed sense of wellness to it. He makes smoothies and he helps ground the school staff and the students in a way that um, I believe all our schools deserve. So um, Lance is going to give us a little taste of that this morning. I'm turning it over to you, Lance. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah. Good morning, everyone, right here and right now. And thank you so much for that warm, welcoming uh, introduction. My heart's touched just hearing how you've um, felt about the environment that I create for staff. And uh, as we're all learning to heal and grow and be more trauma informed and really reach our students and teachers to be their best selves. So thank you for that introduction. Uh, it's my privilege and honor to invite you to a meditation moment, something that I that we practice at Frick School. So everyone, I'm going to invite you, if you feel comfortable to close your eyes or do a soft gaze looking down, I'm gonna tap the bell. Let the sound of the bell be the invitation to notice your breathing. Slowly breathing in and out at your own pace. Make sure the shoulders are nice and relaxed. Make sure there's a softness in the face. Your spine is in line. Your feet are grounded in some way and fully be here, allowing the breath guide you in this moment. Notice the experience. Notice the quality of how you're breathing. Notice the sensation of the heart beating, that life force energy that is always with you ever since you were born, just like the breath is always with you. So let's think of this as a homecoming on this thankful Thursday meditation moment. You may notice the rise and fall of your chest or stomach. Allow the mind to sit in the background and just be the observer, not the thinker, not the doer. But let it just be. In a way, think of this as giving oxygen to the mind. What a beautiful gift. What a great way to recharge the full body system, mind, body, and spirit. Be with your breathing pace, your natural flow. This is you. This is who you are right here in this moment. If a wandering thought surfaces, you can say thinking in a loving, gentle way, no judgment, just an observation and return to the breath. The breath is your friend. The breath is your guide.
In this moment, I would like to invite you to imagine what will your self-care look like for the rest of the day? See it in the mind's eye. How are you going to take care of yourself? Whether that's through nutrition, hydration, exercise, doing things that you love to do. How are you going to integrate that in the re for the rest of the day and the rest of the week, leading into the weekend? See it to be it as you name it and claim it to be your source of well-being as we are all in the practice of being our own health care provider. Be with this for a moment as you're breathing in and out. How will you take care of yourself? What will that look like? Breathing in and breathing out. And then lastly, I'd like to invite you to open up the heart space of grace and gratitude on this thankful Thursday. And take in for a moment, think of something that you are thankful for that you have in your life. During such crazy making times, there's always some good somewhere, whether that's a friend, a family member, or the fact that you have hot water, electricity, whatever resources, access that you have, whatever that is, a favorite pair of shoes that you enjoy walking in, take a moment to be with that and giving thanks to that. And hold that in the heart of gratitude, slowly breathing in and out at your own pace. Thank you. And so it is. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thanks for having me to share this moment with you. Be well. Thank you, Lance. I will now forever think of you as a guru in an Adidas jacket. <laughs> And I hope that as uh, we consider bringing Lance's version of wellness to our schools and health centers that we'll consider not just the teachers as well, but the clerks and custodians and vice principals and school nurses and grandparents and everyone who touches our young people to give help, give us all that kind of grace and gratitude. So you may have gathered from some of our technical snafus the past few days that it has been difficult to host a first virtual conference. But at CSHA, we know that the challenges we're facing are nothing compared to the ones that you are experiencing in your own virtual odysseys. As clinicians learning to use telehealth for the first time, as teachers trying to connect with your students on Zoom and all the myriad other digital platforms you're using, as administrators trying to adjust and plan and adjust again and anticipate and cut and um, think about the very difficult um, trade-offs that have to do with reopening schools and healthcare. Um, as parents and families coping with job loss, remote learning, crowded homes, um, intermittent Wi-Fi, uncertainty, anxiety, and even trauma. We know that it's really hard for you as helpers. You're in school-based healthcare because delivering healthcare, do, delivering routine healthcare to treat or manage disease is just not your jam. You wanna prevent disease and pregnancy and pain and oral healthcare problems and vaping. <laughs> You are dental hygienists who are mentoring first-generation students so they can finish high school and go to college. You're collaborators and innovators who wanna take what we've learned about childhood trauma and apply them to cultural definitions of obesity. You're clinicians working the food lines. You're Native American therapists who are using and leveraging cultural honor to help with radical healing for young people your protégés of Dr. Staggers and Dr. Sm and Dr. King and Dr. Smith Ariaga. You're never content to wait for clients to come to you. You're gonna go find them wherever they are and get them what they need 
whether it's computers or hotspots or healthcare or food. And when you face threats to reproductive health or LGBTQ rights, pandemics, wildfires, budget cuts, disproportionality in special education and state sanctioned violence against black Amer Americans, you do not give up, you get stronger. That's what we love about you. Time and again, I'm seeing it here at this conference in the articles you're posting and the questions you ask, the challenges that you put toward us and the fact that you're here when many of you, of you have lost hours or work. So whether you're out there paving new roads with social media and youth engagement, or you can't be on the front lines with youth right now because your organization has called you to the front lines with COVID. I hope that today and this week you have found or will find the inspiration and hope and reconnection to the passion and purpose that I have. I hope you'll learn some new ideas to try to improve health, wellness, and that elusive American ideal of equality that I know we haven't given up on. And although this past year has been exhausting for most and traumatic for some, it has also been a transformational year for many of us, a year of awakening consciousness or reawakening consciousness, a long overdue personal and evolving national reckoning. I know that many of you have joined us today in the same spirit, recognizing that we're in a critical moment for how we show up for the young people in our schools, in our communities, and across the state because they most certainly are not broken, but in fact are the solution to many of the problems we have made. In that vein, I would like to introduce our second amazing keynote speaker, Dr. Tishiana Arma. My colleague, Jessica Dyer and I both had the fortune of seeing Dr. Arma present at a National School-Based Health Center webinar a few months ago, and we were both moved and awed by her raw honesty and insightful observations about race, education, health, mental health, and stress. We reached out to her and it turned out she had not prepared for that webinar. So that was impressive. And we were thrilled that she was available to join us today and excited that she wants to join our movement in California and the nation's evolvement, evolving movement for school health, youth wellness, and social justice. Dr. Arma is a practicing psychiatrist and the medical director and vice president of behavioral health at Community Health Center, Inc., a large FQHC system that operates many school-based health centers in Connecticut. That's one of the advantages of virtual conferences that she can join us today. Dr. Arma also teaches <clears throat> at the Yale School of Medicine and has been active in social justice issues during her entire career. I think you'll find her talk both deeply personal and also thought provoking in terms of what we can all do differently to support youth and racial equity. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tishiana Arma. Thank you so much, Tracy. And your kind words are warming my heart. Um, and so I will begin immediately. Thank you so much for inviting me. Six years ago, in a cold, dimly lit ultrasound lab, my husband and I sat quietly beside each other. He smiled and took my hand as we waited to learn the gender of our second child. We looked on as the technician took snapshots of a tiny beating heart and measured little limbs. Then turning to us, she announced our two-year-old daughter would soon have the baby sister she had prayed for. At that moment, to our surprise, my husband and I simultaneously breathed out loud sighs of relief. <sighs> Later that evening, for the first time, my husband and I shared with one another the unspoken fears we felt in that ultrasound lab. 
causing us to hold our breath at the prospect of having a son. You see, both of us had begun to dread the future a little black boy would face growing up in the United States. We understood that he would not be protected by his graduate level education parents res with respected professions, career achievements, adequate income, or even our low crime rate suburban home environment. My husband and I had never spoken these fears aloud because our life experiences had programmed us to avoid facing the demoralizing realities of what it means to be black in America. My husband and I knew that even if our son could escape a fatal and public view end, his options would always be limited by his beautiful brown skin. And we knew that other threats would undoubtedly lead to a less visible but more insidious end. The status of being black in America is correlated with devastating physical consequences. Chronic stress not only to not only leads to negative emotions, but can induce an immune response commonly associated with infections and tissue damage. Increased levels of inflammation biomarkers can lead to chronic low-grade inflammation and other biological dysfunctions. Diseases linked to both stress and inflammation include diabetes, cancer, cardiovascular dysfunctions, autoimmune syndromes, and mental illness such as depression and anxiety disorders. Studies have linked prolonged exposure to the physiological effects of chronic stress to structural transformations such as macroscopic changes to certain areas of the brain as volume and neuronal plasticity decrease over time. These and other changes are similar to findings in post-mortem examinations of people who suffered from depression. Doctors David Williams and Tanae Lewis are studying, measuring, and compiling data on how the persistent devaluation and trauma of Black lives impacts Black bodies and minds. Human studies have revealed direct correlations between racial discrimination and adverse cardiovascular disease outcomes, obesity, visceral fat, breast cancer, elevated nocturnal blood pressure, depression, and poor sleep quality and duration. So the destructive impact of racial discrimination not only drives the choices Black people make as to when, where, and if we will risk raising our hands or lifting our voices, the impact of our physical health can reach down to the very fabric of our DNA. Telomeres are compound structures of repetitive nucleotide sequences at the ends of chromosomes that serve to protect genetic information during the process of cell division. Telomeres shorten during duplication so that over time they lose their capacity to protect the DNA and cell function is hampered. Decreases in telomere length are associated with decreases, diseases of aging and greater mortality risks. One important factor influencing telomere length is chronic stress. Stress endured over time is correlated with the breakdown of telomeres, a phenomenon called weathering. Now studies have even identified weathering in children as young as ages four to 14, showing salivary telomere length shortening with exposure to community level stress. A growing number of studies have proven that interpersonal experiences of racial discrimination and internalization of negative racial bias shorten telomere length and accelerate the aging in Black Americans compared to their white peers. So you cannot be a child selling lemonade near your home or playing with your toy in the park or be a doctor loading medical supplies for the homeless or a customer shopping in a store or a student reading a book in your own school lunchroom or even a homeowner just trying to enter your house without the potential of being confronted with questions or demands to justify your presence because you don't fit the profile of someone who belongs. 
make no mistake. In the absence of cameras cued and an audience, the daily level of trauma and stress experienced by Black people is slowly killing us. Only eight days after the birth of my second child, the shooting death of Michael Brown by police hit the headlines, hit the Black community, and hit my soul. I was disturbed by the media coverage and distressed by a white friend who dismissed public outrage and argued that Michael Brown had only gotten what he deserved. My friend and the media ignored the undeniable reality that young black men in particular are killed by police at alarming rates. So in response, I decided to risk sharing my vulnerability as a black parent in the introduction to an article I was writing on the unique challenges of raising a black child in the United States. I wanted to explore what I knew to be true that black men are two and a half times more likely to be killed at the hands of police, six times more likely to be incarcerated and likely to receive harsher sentences than whites for similar offenses. These injustices only compound the massive disparities in income, wealth, health, healthcare, housing, education, academic achievement and employment. Blacks suffer when compared to their white counterparts. Pew Research Surveys, as recent as June of 2020, report that many people outside the Black community remain convinced that African Americans have the same opportunities as whites. But the data paint a vastly different picture, and the bleak statistics have remained largely unchanged for centuries. When my nine-year-old daughter heard the devastating disparities, she asked me, how about the girls? Well, she was troubled to learn they fared only little better than our boys. See, Black children are born into a country where on average, Blacks are paid only 59 cents for every dollar paid to whites. And as a consequence of systemic racial barriers to the creation of intergenerational wealth, Blacks own only 10 cents for every dollar of wealth owned by whites. Since work is usually necessary to acquire wealth, we have to consider employment. Well, compared to his white peers, black, a black man now has a 6% greater risk of being unemployed. A study conducted in 2003 and replicated in 2017 revealed that all other things being equal, black males with no criminal record received fewer job callbacks than whites with a record. Also in 2017, on average, the black home ownership rate was only 42% compared to 72% for whites, representing a 30% gap. Now that is higher than was the case when housing discrimination was explicitly legal. Black owned homes that are comparable to white owned homes with similar amenities in similar neighborhoods are worth 23% less amounting to 156 billion in cumulative losses in majority black neighborhoods. And although only 10% of neighborhoods are majority black, they are home to approximately 40% of the black population. Historical records recount how this level of segregation in our country did not come about by chance or the preference of Black people. It was deliberate, systemic, and designed to be sustained. The racial inequities in healthcare, detailed in the 2003 Institute of Medicine Unequal Treatment Report, have remained largely unchanged. According to the CDC, even in states with the lowest pregnancy-related mortality ratios, Black mothers in the U.S. diet rates three to four times like higher than white mothers. A Black woman is 22% more likely to die from heart disease than a white woman and 71% more likely to die from cervical cancer. But as a Black woman, we are 243% more likely to die from pregnancy or childbirth related causes than white women. Many people 
black and white alike, wanted to believe that Barack Obama's presidency pointed the way to a post-racial society. Yet today, we live in a uniquely troubled and historic time. Longtime activists for justice are educating and implementing strategies to address systemic racism. Some citizens are encountering the realities of what it means to be Black in America for the first time and are committed to learning more. Still, others feel overwhelmed, even paralyzed by grief and outrage, while too many of our fellow citizens loudly refuse to participate in any conversations around racial inequities or efforts to eliminate them. Others simply sit in silence. Though all of us may not share the same commitment to racial justice, I believe this is a time of great hope and promise. Healing, healing can come if we find the courage to open ourselves to truth, to share and listen to one another's stories and with compassion and to ask the hard questions about our shared past, our present, and our future. So today, in the spirit of moving forward toward that healing, I will share my story with you by highlighting three formative factors that built the resilience to carry me through my life experiences. The three factors are cultural pride reinforcement, supports, and exposures. Let's start with cultural pride reinforcement. I grew up in poverty in the inner city. Although I was a child, I, you know, as a child, I didn't have a name for it. Cultural pride reinforcement was the rule and not the exception in my childhood home. My mother would only buy me black dolls to counter the pervasive images from the outside world, stipulating that only being or striving to be white was beautiful. As opportunities allowed, my family patronized black owned businesses. Dr. Carter, a black woman was our family physician and a strong role model for me. My mother taught me the history of black people before, during and after they had been taken into slavery from the shores of Africa and their great kingdoms. Thanks to her tutelage, unlike many of my black friends, I reveled in being a black girl in America. I learned that the first universities on earth had been founded on the continent of Africa. I learned countless other firsts and of inventions by people who looked just like me. And I felt incredible pride and admiration for my ancestors, the people who had gone before me to build and spread knowledge across cultures and continents. The facts about early civilizations that were overlooked in my schools were nevertheless, nevertheless affixed to the walls of our home. Even our calendars were adorned with images of beautiful brown royalty that made me feel regal when I looked in the mirror. Even as she built my confidence in and appreciation for my heritage, my mother never failed to explain the realities Black people faced in America. She taught me about our struggles and the fight for freedom from the times of Western colonization of Africa through the enslavement of Africa's people in America. She shared stories of the freedom fighters and heroes of long and, unfish and the unfinished civil rights movement who suffered and sacrificed with dignity for the sake of my rights. I learned about my own family members who had joined in the struggle. In her telling, my mother allowed no illusions that the battles for equal justice, the fight for human, basic human rights, since the times of subjugation and segregation to the present had been won. Now, understanding my history inspired me to share it with my friends, most of whom were actually from solidly middle-class, intact, two-parent Black homes, unlike my own. I learned to my surprise that they had little to no knowledge of their black heritage, too little to have pride in it. Despite my having grown up in poverty, no one could say anything to convince me that I wasn't something and that there was something I couldn't do, that I wasn't intelligent or that I wasn't beautiful. No one could make me believe that the dire circumstances of most black Americans 
were outcomes of laziness, proclivity to criminal behaviors, or preference for life in the ghettos. I still hear and wholly reject the same assertions today, some even espoused by a few prominent Black figures in the media. I also understood that though my brown skin did not in any way lessen my aptitudes, it did heighten the fears others may have had about me. And I was keenly aware of the potential for these fears to undermine me and my performance. Studies show that cultural pride reinforcement alone is the most consistent of racial socialization messages correlated to greater cognitive and behavioral competence, self-esteem, and mental health. Clearest correlations to higher grades were shown by Black students whose parents had transmitted consciousness of racial barriers to their children. As in my own story, acknowledgement of the past and realities of the present give Black youth necessary perspectives and solidly grounded hopes for the future. Now, lest I paint too rosy a picture, the beautiful and engaging home of my early youth was not without complications. My mother was ill with lupus, an autoimmune disease that had afflicted her since her late teens. And that meant frequent long hospitalizations. My stepfather, a Vietnam veteran, suffered from untreated PTSD and struggled daily with alcohol and a drug use disorder. I was in my first year at the Milton Hershey School, a cost-free private co-residential school and home for children from lower income families located in Pennsylvania. Grades for the first trimester had just been posted. And that week, my mother had been stepped down from the ICU post-op for a perforated ulcer. I was so eager to celebrate my good grades with her, I called her hospital room phone. There was no answer. I soon learned that my mother, the primary source of my strength and support, the one who had instilled so much love, confidence, and cultural pride in me, had taken her final breath the night before. I had telephoned into a hospital room already emptied of my mother's life, already cleared for the next patient. But I clung to my mother's spirit and lessons, and they stayed on with me. After her death, I was able to find my biological father who had been lost to our family. But our reunion and prospects for a relationship ended with his untimely death less than one year after my mother's. For the next three years, I continued with my high school studies without a legal guardian. Now, the unfortunate reality is that the adversities of my early life are shared with far too many children, nearly a quarter of the population. However, the proportion experiencing these adversities in the Black and Native American communities should alarm you. I had lost both my parents, but fortunately, my need for support of affirming adults was met by a number of sources. A significant source came from a couple who lived and worked as house parents of a home for elementary school children at the Milton Hershey School. The Turners were originally from Ohio town where there had only been one black family there when they were growing up. Yet, they invited me to come live in their home with them and their little daughter, welcoming me as a daughter to become the big sister to the young children in their care. I was assigned responsibilities, allowing me to serve as a role model, joining in their daily activities. I sometimes helped with their homework and grooming. I did home science experiments with them as a treat. And it was all a joy for me because I had grown up as an only child, always yearning for younger siblings. The children in our Hershey home were from various races, mom and pop, as we chose to call them readily volunteered that although they did not understand all of our differences, they were always willing to listen and eager to learn more. They explained how honest, though difficult conversations about race in their childhood homes had laid the foundation that shaped their perspectives. Another formative level 
of support came primarily from black and brown teenage, uh, teachers who would allow black and brown students to sit in their rooms after classes and process the day's events or to just get a breather. For students involved in sports, a black coach played that role. These school faculty and staff members served as our mentors and confidants. They consistently conveyed the message that we added value to our world. Their reassurance helped protect us against the demeaning and dismissive messages conveyed by others. Their affirmation boosted our determination to exceed the low expectations held for us in marked contrast to the high expectations held for our majority peers. I also found a crucial level of support in my faith. A lot of prayer, reading religious texts and fellowship with the members of an all white church, the only one of my denomination in the area. I could relate to my fellow congregants because we were all reading the same book and hearing the same messages from its pages. In their company, I was reminded that I was defined by more than my race and I thrived emotionally. My lived experience bore out what studies have shown. Religious engagement, including church-based social support, attendance to religious services and seeking religious guidance in everyday life are associated with reducing the negative effects of racial discrimination on mental health. We've considered two of our three factors that will build resiliency in our children. Now we'll explore exposure. By exposure, I'm referring to varied positive encounters with different ways of thinking, places, countries, cultures, experiences, and professions. For me, these such encounters, you know, came early through the people I met as a young child. Black businessmen and entrepreneurs, Black artists and singers, musicians and writers, and Black educators and healthcare professionals. More exposures came later on through my participation in arts and theater, involvement in protesting, advocacy, student government, student membership on committees that set school priorities and future direction, travel for competitions, exploration of nature, herding and farming. Ah, the richness of and variety of these experiences made me yearn for more opportunities to learn about the wider world beyond the confines of my immediate environment. They seeded my heart and mind with ideas that would later grow into new interests and generate unique perspectives. Studies have shown that advocacy, protest, empowerment, and cultural affirmation are associated with lower youth suicide risk with a dose response relationship. The harsh reality I returned to after graduating from Hershey was that though not perfect, the school had served in many ways as a utopia that did not exist beyond the acreage of its campus. Beyond the blatant caught on camera brutalities to which black people are subjected, the pervasive devaluation of black life occurs on a continuum of injuries that may be visible at times and invisible at other times to onlookers. The last dying words, I can't breathe, cried out by Eric Gardner and George Floyd have come to symbolize daily reality for black people in America. Though there may not be visible nooses around or knees on our necks. Black men, women, and children in your organization, schools, and communities are literally and figuratively crying out, sometimes aloud, more often voiceless. I can't breathe. Black people have been indoctrinated to believe that we as individuals must carry the burden of representing our entire race as we go about our daily lives. Whether we are taking a test, walking through a store, or standing to give a speech. 
We see ourselves in the members of our community who are the lost, the battered, and the accused. We know that regardless of our status, education, or fancy neighborhoods, our names have equal potential to be added to the grievous list. Breonna Taylor, Trayvon Martin, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Amadou Diallo, Robbie Tolan, Youssef Salam, each of you here today knows more than one person. Colleagues, staff members, constituents, community partners, teachers, parents, or students who have feared for the lives of their children, parents, or other family members or partners because they live in America while Black. And your acquaintances may have also feared for themselves. Hearts racing, short of breath, abdominal upset, disturbing images flooding their minds. Preliminary studies correlated declines in mental health for months after a police killing of an unarmed, unarmed Black person. But it would be disingenuous for me to illustrate these terrible consequential racial adversities from a purely observational and intellectual perspective. My views on the mental health toll of racism on Black people are not the view of a bystander. Rather, as a Black woman, I too am directly impacted by racial injustice. I am sure that those of you who serve in behavioral health positions recognize the symptoms I mentioned as anxiety and trauma related. They were the same symptoms I experienced five years ago as news of Sandra Bland's death broke. Later, as I processed the circumstances around her arrest that began to play out in my mind, in my own imagination, her likely fear as she saw the approaching police officer through her rearview mirror. I thought about how I would have felt and what I would have done in that situation and about the times that I'd been stopped by police in the past. In the days and weeks that followed, despite four years driving two hour daily commutes between my home and Yale University, I suddenly found myself struggling to make just now the short 15 to 20 minute drive into work without feeling nauseated. In the car, I could hear my heart pounding, feel my chest tightening, and at times my breath coming in gas. On more than one occasion, my fear became so intense, I had to stop on the side of the road to collect myself. A few times, I even believed for a moment, I heard the distant sounds of sirens behind me, but there were no police at sight. Despite being a law-abiding, highly educated, securely employed, and mindful citizen, and for goodness sakes, a psychiatrist, I experienced these trauma-related symptoms because I knew Sandra Bland's fate could have been my own. So when news broke this May of yet another black life violently and needlessly cut short, it had become clear the lives of black people in particular are not valued by all. It was devastating that we had not seen progress and, and my article remained just as relevant five years later and would likely continue to be for decades more. When news of these killings is reported and lack of justice follows over and over, it seems many people around us continue to go about their lives, business as usual. Our Black experience is invalidated. Further along the continuum are common negative stereotypes of Blacks that dominate mainstream society. The weak efforts and often outright reluctance to seek out qualified Black staff, leaders, and support of Black companies deprives young Black children the opportunity of being inspired by people who reflect what they see in the mirror. 
absent positive Black role models in their lives, Black youths are left without aspirations to move themselves in their communities beyond disparaging media messages and daily hardships. Systemic racial inequities occupy another space along the continuum. Racial inequities greatly impact access to healthcare and educational opportunities for Black people, diminishing their prospects of providing for their thriving families, uh, for, for thriving families, communities, and leading productive lives. Blacks must contend with other devastating disadvantages like higher amputation rates, lower academic test scores. Many non-Blacks take comfort in trying to explain away these disparities with arguments of genetics, character flaws, solely economic circumstances, or any combination of these factors. Rather than take the risk of confronting the real underlying contributors head on. Those of us in the fields of healthcare and education, our helping professions, do not want to imagine we would play any part in promoting racial disparities. Who would want to think a phenomenon like bias plays a role in our work? Yet, this is precisely what studies have proven. Using groups of standardized patients, experiments in healthcare settings show that all other demographics being equal, racial differences between patients and their providers produce disparate treatment outcomes. These disparities affect how patient-centered our practices are, how closely we listen to our patients, and whether our patients trust us and feel satisfied with their visits. Unless we are able to engage in the uncomfortable reflection on our own hidden biases and the roles we play in the status of Black Americans' health, we'll only find ourselves back in the perpetual loop time and again, protesting injustice that seems intractable. From my particular perspective as a psychiatrist, I will end the continuum on another form of injury, microaggression. The insidious daily insults that convey to us that living while Black is an affront to the rest of society. These assaults add up to a level of trauma equivalent to death by a thousand needles. Too often, Black voices are not heard through our days at school or work, perhaps because when we do speak up, non-Black people seem compelled to translate our words to our peers or our suggestions or ideas are simply ignored as though we weren't even in the room. The reality is black people must play by different rules. Like children with unpredictable parents, we must be cautious lest we be perceived as aggressive or intimidating. If we do summon the courage to call out inequitable treatment along racial lines, we are often accused of pulling the race card. But in treatment, are we more often the ones who have DCF or ambulances called to solve problems instead of treaters seeking more creative, client-engaged solutions for us? In schools, do we often find ourselves in the principal's office more than others? In our workplaces, do we find ourselves written up or placed on a performance improvement plan faster than anyone else? Though systemic racism is deeply rooted and it's pervasive in the United States, there are steps each of us can take to make meaningful change, not only a hope, but a reality. How can your school-based health centers, your partners, and your advocates promote positive factors and translate them into policies and practices that remedy some of the harms done to the minds and bodies of Black children, families, and communities? Now, I ask each of you to pick up a paper and pen and put down any preconceived notions you may have and open your mind to new possibilities. I'm inviting you to consider a series of questions about your role in promoting the three factors I illustrated for building resilience in Black children facing racism. 
cultural pride reinforcement, support, and exposure. Grappling with the questions and possible answers may lead to transformational change. What are you doing to foster cultural pride in the diverse group of children you are serving within your schools and surrounding communities? What messages are you conveying to your children by the educational and promotional materials displayed on the walls of your centers? When additional employees are needed to work in your organization, do you seek out Black-owned recruitment agencies to participate in your hiring process? Are Black-owned vendors or service providers even considered? The children and families in the communities that you serve patronize your business. Do you patronize theirs? How much do your lack of knowledge about Black people in the history of America and the world shape the way you view Black people? Do your daily interactions and assumptions strip Black people of their cultural pride because negative stereotypes dominate your interactions with them? Now, let's consider the series of questions linked to supports. The supports your organizations lend your employees and communities will hinge on your implementation strategies being both informed and intentional. Are you examining your patient population outcomes to identify racial trends and then using that data, collect, collect it to affect some positive change? Do you identify and pay keen attention to racial disparities in the data reported? Or do you persist in believing poverty is the only problem to be solved, ignoring the impact of, on healthcare? Are you making good faith efforts to draw your employees from within your, the communities you serve? Perhaps your organization has succeeded in employing a small number of Black, Brown, and Indigenous people from the community on staff. But are they being retained at the rate of your other staff? Do you prepare and encourage Black, Brown, and Indigenous staff to apply for leadership positions in your organizations? Finally, let's look at the third formative factor that builds resist resiliency, exposures. People, time, space, and ideas are valuable resources that your organizations could provide to your schools, children, and communities to enrich their exposures. One exposure is your staff. The composition of your staff has an impact on children's perceptions of who qualifies as a healthcare professional. How well does the racial composition of your workforce reflect the community you serve? How, how might you be able to maybe arrange one hour of monthly time that's paid for your staff to be a mentor? Could you provide annual workshops on financial literacy and cooking healthy on a limited budget? Could you teach community members how to advocate for themselves by sharing practical information on testifying, contacting their legislators, or writing op-eds effectively? Could you invest in on-the-job training and vocational education for Black members of our community? Through partnering with other community organizations, businesses, and individuals, could you initiate out-of-the-box projects designed to improve health status for children and communities, like supporting a few garden beds at a school that you serve, addressing inactivity and obesity? As staff members or partners, are you prepared to hold your school-based account, uh, centers accountable? Leaders, as you return to these questions and bring them back to your agencies, please keep one thing in mind, especially for the final two categories of support and exposures. Talent is universal, but opportunity is preferential. Remember, if you make all these opportunities available without intentionally bringing them to and advertising them in spaces Black people frequent, churches, social media platforms, Black organizations, the likely recipients of your efforts will only be the already advantaged members of your community, like your next door neighbor's niece, rather than those who you most seek to serve. For Black people listening today, I encourage you to hold your organizations and colleagues accountable if you feel you can. 
Now, everyone should be highlighting inequities and institutionalized racism because addressing these problems benefits the entire community. But as Black people, we have to rethink whether we can continue to endure the persistent injuries we encounter in our daily lives without addressing them as they occur in real time. We have been too quiet for too long. When we experience vicarious trauma of seeing a Black person killed before our eyes, we may not be able to predict our own reactions. Now, you may feel you're at a breaking point. I've felt the same way at different times in my life, including on one recent occasion. All of us need to step back for a moment and decide how we are going to deal with individuals and institutions that contribute to and symbolize the injustices all around us. I recommend that we thoughtfully point out injustices as they occur, rather than carrying pent up frustrations over years. That might prevent our eruption during a single painful interaction without context for the other party. We must do the daily work of informing and supporting equitable actions and decisions, whether whatever they concern, whether how to the patient population is served or how employees' performance is confirmed and valued. Now, many of the remedies we have considered today could unfold organically if we could become more aware of our biases and be empowered to move beyond them. We must not lose sight of the fact that unconscious attitudes, whether they stem from misguided notions of colorblind ideologies or lack of exposure to diverse cultures, present insurmountable barriers to progress. Although discussions of race may seem daunting, therapists serving in school-based health centers must be prepared to talk to children about racial discrimination. Children need to feel assured that therapy sessions provide safe spaces where they can open up without fear. If, if they are left on their own to deal with bigotry and prejudice, Black children are at a greater risk of emotional, behavioral, academic, and physical disadvantages. On the other hand, if white children are deprived of authentic depictions of Black people and realistic conversations about race, they will inevitably develop racist ideas that are reinforced by the media and they will persist into adulthood. Now we can no longer avoid having explicit conversations about racism and discrimination. Given your organizational imperatives to improve the physical and mental health of your students and communities, any reluctance to openly address racial disparities and their effects are like trying to mop up water from an overflowing sink without first turning off the faucet. Unless we enlarge and enrich our capacity for empathy, all of the policy and programming changes you make to in or, or increase diversity hires will not produce the transformational change and, and racial equity that you aspire to achieve. By way of illustration, I'm going to end with a poem that I wrote during some of my sleepless nights with right after George Floyd's death. Three seconds. A poem for those who identify as white and say they want to be a part of the solution. This could be the turning point for our country to mend. If people ask what they can do after the outrage, the posts and the protests end. Racism, bias, prejudice and injustice didn't mysteriously appear overnight. So, overnight. So if this country is to overcome their effects, we'll need every willing person to join in the fight. You may feel overwhelmed by all that you don't know that you don't know needed to confront this blight. There's work to be done at every front from law enforcement, housing and education to healthcare, employment, legislation, food access and wealth creation. So I challenge you to start with one simple exercise today. In your next interaction with a black person, use a three second rule for what you do or say. Before you decide if the next move and judge if they were right, take just three seconds to step back and imagine that they were white. Engaging in this exercise might just save a life. Whatever you were about to do, underestimate, ignore, belittle, call 91, delay, talk over, yell out, question, accuse, or turn away. Whatever you were going to do, now instead react to them the way you would if they looked like you. I leave you with this. 
As you invest your efforts, whether in individual, school, district, or state levels, do everything you can to implement these factors. If you dedicate the time, garner, garner leadership or support, and hold yourself accountable to act, you will become a part of their narratives. You will share in their stories of overcoming. You will have a place in their chronicles of resilience. You can help build the hope necessary for a promising future. Over time, down the road, if you are self-reflective and honest, you might just save a life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ama. I know that everyone in this um, conference is reeling right now with um, your words and your emotion. Um, and so I thank you for sharing that with us. And I'm so grateful again for you being here today. Thank you so much, Tracy. Thank you. And you are regal. So uh, an appropriate transition after deep and profound thinking is to talk about raffle prizes. Um, we have some <laughs> raffle winners from yesterday and I would like to announce them. They are Lonnie Passion. Apologies if I pronounce your name wrong. Christina Hirsch, Stacy Schumacher, Ichacato de la Cruz, and Jacqueline Alvarez, congratulations. And it's not over, you still have more chances to win today. So if you, um, if you haven't completed the exhibitor quiz, check that out. Um, get entered into the raffle for completing today's evaluation, which we will send you um, through the event feed and also email out this evening. And check out that leaderboard. Way to go, Hana. Uh, we will announce a winner for the leaderboard after the conference ends, so go crazy. Um, when we're done here momentarily, please go to the agenda and click to join the Zumba break with Nicole from Anissa Women's Fitness. Then our next workshop start at 1030. Uh, we will also have a more relaxing break at 1130, mindful stretching with our very own Jessica Dyer, who is as good as Lance. We will have our last series of workshops at 1230 and then we'll see you back in the main plenary at 1.30 for our closing session. And we'll talk, uh, we'll share CSHA's strategic plan and our vision for the next three years and how you fit in. So thank you everyone. Thank you, Dr. Arma and Lance. Um, you are all the best and enjoy your day.